Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to the applicant webinar for the Evidence for Action Approaches to Advanced Gender Equity from Around the Globe. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you are all safe and healthy wherever you're joining us from. Today, we will briefly introduce you to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Evidence for Action. I know some of you may not be familiar with RWJF or E4A. We'll discuss why we've released this solicitation and offer insights into the types of study approaches and research projects that will be a good fit for this call for proposal. We'll provide an overview of the funding opportunity, application process, eligibility, and selection criteria and discuss grantee expectations. We've also set aside time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. To ask a question, just type it into the chat feature at the bottom left-hand side of the conference window, and we'll get to it at the end of the session. The webinar is being recorded, and a link with the accompanying slides will be available on our website, evidenceforaction.org, uh, in two to three days. Also, if you have any technical issues during the conference, someone from ReadyTalk is monitoring the chat and will be able to assist you. I'd like to start by introducing our speakers, including myself. I am Erin Hagen, the Deputy Director for Evidence for Action. Joining me today is the Evidence for Action Director, Nancy Adler, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Global Ideas for U.S. Solutions Team Director, Karobi Acharya. We will also be joined during the Q&A session by Maylin Tan, who's the EFRA Assistant Deputy, and took a lead role in developing this call for proposals. We have a lot to cover, so let's get right into it. Karobi, I'll turn to you first to provide some of the background on RWJF. Great. Thanks so much, Erin. So it's really exciting to see so many people from different places around the globe with us today, um, as well as folks who are close to home. We have people from over 30 countries registered for this webinar. So as Erin said, I direct the RWJF Global Ideas for U.S. Solutions team. Uh, as most of you probably know, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is the nation's largest philanthropy dedicated solely to improving health and well-being for all who live in the United States. For over 40 years, we've worked alongside others to take on the major health and health care issues impacting the U.S. And we're driven by a vision where everyone, everyone has the opportunity to live the healthiest life possible, regardless of who they are, how much they earn, or where they live. And we call this vision a culture of health. To get to this culture of health, we need a society that prioritizes health, where good health is a fundamental value that guides our personal decisions and the decisions that impact us all, from how we design our cities to how we devise new employment policies. Building a culture of health is a big goal. It's going to take the best ideas that the world has to offer. And that's why at RWJF, we actively look to other countries to learn from the best practices and wisdom around the world, to find programs, policies, and approaches that are self solving some of the same problems that we face here, but they're doing it in ways that we haven't yet tried or could even imagine. We can see these new possibilities by traveling abroad, either literally or figuratively. And we like to say that good ideas have no borders. When we look across the world, across geographies and income levels, we see there's so much to learn from countries that have made progress in addressing some of the same kinds of challenges that we face here in the U.S. We explore how these places have undergone significant cultural shifts and brought about large-scale change to improve health and well-being. And we seek to understand how we might model their successes and adapt their good ideas to improve health and well-being in the U.S. Central to our vision of the culture of health is achieving health equity. We all benefit when everyone has a fair shot at access to good jobs with fair pay, good schools, affordable housing, safe neighborhoods, 
quality medical care, and the list goes on. That's health equity, when we all have the basics to be as healthy as possible. We've made tremendous progress in the U.S. towards ensuring that everyone, regardless of their gender, has access to opportunities for good health. Um, This year, we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which is a landmark in the women's suffrage movement. And just last week, our Supreme Court ruled that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 applies to discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And yet, bias and discrimination and harmful gender norms continue to impact people's ability to live the healthiest life possible. Social norms, cultural stereotypes, and social attitudes have created gender straitjackets and shaped policies and practices at all levels that create deep-rooted barriers to good health for girls, boys, and gender-fluid kids alike, as well as for adults across the gender spectrum. And as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated existing inequities, including around gender. Women are more likely to serve as essential and frontline workers, and for transgender women, the pandemic has further limited their access to health care. At the same time, COVID-19 has also highlighted the value of gender equity in practice. Many of the countries that have the strongest response, Germany and New Zealand, for example, are led by women. We know that to build a culture of health, we must work together to alter the systems that keep gender inequity in place. And we know there's much to learn from the world from how other countries and cultures are achieving gender equity. And that's why we're really excited for this funding opportunity. We're eager eager to surface gender equity initiatives underway outside the U.S. that are supported by evidence and that have the potential to be adapted and implemented to improve health and well-being for all in the U.S. and achieve health equity. So I'll turn to Nancy now to share a bit more information about the Evidence for Action program and our joint call for proposals. Thank you so much, Robbie. Evidence for Action, or E4A, is a signature research program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and it's based at the Center for Health and Community at the University of California, San Francisco. The mission of E4A is to support research that's likely to yield convincing findings regarding population health, well-being, and equity, and looking at the impact of specific policy and program interventions. We achieve this mission by awarding grants to our general rolling call for proposals and providing technical assistance. More information is available on our other program activities and funding opportunities on our website. Through this particular call for proposals, we'll be awarding grants to support research assessing the potential to adapt and translate to the United States interventions from around the globe that have proven have been proven to improve gender equity. We urge you to review the CFP itself, as well as the frequently asked questions that are available on the website for more details. With regard to the CFP purpose as stated in the slide, I'd like to highlight a few things. First, in the U.S., determinants of health for the many social, economic, and environmental factors which shape our health relate to personal safety, economic opportunity, education access, post-secondary or beyond, support in workplace and social environments, and protection from bias and discrimination for vulnerable groups. The solutions we seek in this CFP should address root causes operating in the U.S. context. Determinants of health and root causes of gender inequities in the U.S. may differ from those in other countries. For example, the root causes of gender inequities related to education in the U.S. are less about barriers to girls entering or staying in the school system than in other countries. Instead, they have more to do with gender norms and expectations that cause some groups to be marginalized in the education system, workforce, and other social environments based on their gender or sexual identity leading to poor economic opportunities and health outcomes. 
We're therefore interested in understanding how to change systems, norms, and practices such as patriarchy and heterosexism that systematically disfavor women, girls, and other groups based on their gender, gender identity, or sexual identity. We seek to learn from effective programs, policies, and practices that have been implemented in other countries and understand the extent to which these approaches may be adapted for the U.S. population. Some examples of interest include, but in no way are limited to, approaches that aim to counteract cultural stereotypes or expectations that bias women and girls towards low-wage careers or health-damaging jobs or roles or to those that reduce gender-based violence, aggression, or harassment by addressing bias, norms, practices, and resources. There are other groups around the world who have unique traditions and practices related to gender and power norms. For example, there are matriarchal societies in which women hold the power, some of which are indigenous communities. We're interested in learning from and building on such frameworks. We seek approaches that create opportunities for people who have been marginalized based on their gender, who emerge as leaders in government and other positions of influence, where they have more direct impact on decisions that affect their lives and communities. We're also interested in approaches that apply non-binary interpretations of gender and policymaking resource allocation or service provision. I encourage you to read the CFP for additional examples. Please note when you're doing this that the examples provided in the CFP are only to illustrate the types of interventions and projects that may be a good fit. Applicants are in no way limited by these examples. So having given some background on the content of the focus of the research, let me now turn to Aaron to talk about the research process. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks so much. So the main focus of this CFP is really about the ability to adapt an intervention from outside the United States to a U.S. setting. So it's not, we're not looking to build evidence about an intervention's effectiveness in its own country. In fact, we're hoping that that evidence already exists we're really gonna focus on adaptation. Adapting an evidence-based intervention to a new setting is a process. It takes place over many stages, and there are several models and frameworks describing different stages and processes of adaptation. For example, here is an overview from uh, one study that summarizes 11 common steps in the process of adaptation. In this model, the process of adaptation typically starts with assessing the target population, in this case, the United States setting where the intervention is to be adapted. Subsequent adaptation steps may involve identifying an appropriate intervention or approach, exploring the fit and feasibility of the intervention, making modifications as needed, pilot testing, and evaluating the effectiveness in the new setting. We recognize this is not a linear process, which is nicely depicted by the fact that this image is a circle and not a line. And we're interested in research that informs any steps of the adaptation, particularly those corresponding to the early stages of adaptation, such as the exploration, preparation, or implementation phases. Our focus on these steps is heavily influenced by the parameters of this CFP, which we think better lends itself towards those early steps. But we are open, especially if people are leveraging additional resources, to consider any of these stages of the adaptation. The best projects for this call are anything prior to the sustainment phase. Projects in those stages really could be eligible for our rolling call for proposals that Nancy mentioned earlier. So research projects should refer to some type of adaptation framework that is guiding the research approach, like the one we just highlighted. We'll consider studies that quantify policy effects across countries or regions, such as via a systematic review or meta-analysis. We're also open to comparative case studies, which are similar to reviews and meta-analyses, but with more of a mixed methods approach. 
We're really interested in research that sheds light on why an intervention is effective in a home country setting. For example, a theory of change analysis or testing assumptions about causal mechanisms. Feasibility studies that establish evidence of acceptability, demand, or other essential aspects of the intervention in a new setting are also appropriate, as well as implementation studies that are designed to produce findings that inform adaptation or implementation in a U.S. setting, not just in the original home country setting. We are open to pilot studies in the U.S. that rigorously test specific components of the adapted intervention and inform the next stages of implementation. But we do recognize that this type of research may be constrained by resources available through this call for proposals. We recognize that there are well-established global health research initiatives underway, such as the Cochrane Reviews, and we're not trying to duplicate existing efforts, but to fill gaps in the evidence base, particularly related to adaptation. So now that we've discussed the types of research that would be a good fit, let's move on to the nuts and bolts of how to submit a competitive proposal and the practical and logistical aspects of applying. So in the spirit of supporting you to submit the most competitive application, here's a snapshot of what we hope your proposal will entail. There are several points I would like to emphasize. First of all, competitive proposals will clearly demonstrate the potential for an approach from outside the U.S. that improved gender equity to be adapted to and or implemented in the United States. Even though we're particularly interested in applying knowledge to the U.S. context, we do hope that research and activity supported through this CFP will be broadly beneficial beyond the United States. Proposals should address overt or underlying causes of gender inequity in the home country setting. You should thoroughly describe the mechanism or theory of change that explains the intervention's impact on health and gender equity outcomes, and explain how the proposed intervention could be successfully adapted to the U.S. and identify the appropriate end users, for example, program implementers, policymakers, practitioners, et cetera. I want to stress the importance of following the full proposal narrative template in our online application submission system. There is a template available for you there, and please read it carefully and follow it uh, as closely as possible. I'm going to go over it here in a little detail with you. So the most successful full proposals will directly answer the questions that are included in the template uh, and adhere closely to the suggested links for each section. The first section, the research approach, is really the most important component of the full proposal narrative. Applicants will need to clearly articulate a research question or questions and specify what adaptation or implementation framework, theory, or model is guiding the research approach. The project timeline should include major tasks outlined in your narrative and include and allow sufficient time for completion of your dissemination activities described in your dissemination strategy. Research projects will be evaluated on six selection criteria outlined in the call for proposals. The strength of the existing evidence, the effectiveness of the intervention or approach supported by research that demonstrates a beneficial impact of the intervention on health and gender equity outcomes. The relevance to improve gender equity, does the intervention address overt or underlying causes of inequity with an emphasis on improving social and structural determinants of health? The plausibility, is there a plausible argument made for the impact of the intervention on improved health outcomes? Is there a clear theory of change or causal mechanism through which the intervention is presumed to work in the home country setting? Actionability refers to how findings from your research will inform public discourse and decision around policy making, program implementation, funding, and changing practices in the United States. The rigor of the proposed study design can be articulated by having a clear research question, a clear plan for data collection, analysis, and dissemination, and determining whether an appropriate framework that guides implementation or the adaptation is being used. In terms of the qualification for the research team, we think about how strong or authentic the partnerships that are required are, whether work and resources are being equitably distributed across collaborating organizations, 
and whether the research team includes key stakeholders such as practitioners, program implementers, or members of impacted communities. In terms of who's eligible to apply, applicants can be based almost anywhere in the United States. However, we will only fund proposals that demonstrate clear applicability to the United States study. Research projects also must reflect collaboration between U.S. and non-U.S. based organizations based on a pre-existing relationship that demonstrates a durable and a lasting relationship. Applicants will also need to explain the research strategy for determining their, whether their intervention is adaptable to a U.S. setting. We will award up to $1 million U.S. dollars through this call for proposals. That's the total amount available, not the per award amount. Awards per grant will be between $100,000 and 250000 U.S. dollars each. The total number of grants to be awarded will be determined based on the number, size, and scope of the studies proposed. We're anticipating somewhere between four and ten awards. Projects should be for 30 months or less in duration, including dissemination activities. This is a single-stage competitive proposal process consisting of a full proposal of no more than 10 pages accompanied by a dissemination strategy, project timeline, a detailed budget worksheet and narrative, in addition to other supporting documents and technical information about the lead applicant and collaborating organizations. Full proposals and accompanying applicant information are submitted through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's application and review system which can be accessed at my.rwjs.org. Through the system, you can download the application templates, which contain detailed instructions about the specific information we want you to include in your full proposal, along with guidance about how much of your proposal should be dedicated to each section. Please review all the templates and instructions closely. Studies may be conducted in any language, but proposals and deliverables must be submitted in English and all grant administration will be conducted in English. Full proposals will be reviewed by the E4A leadership team, our National Advisory Committee members, experts in implementation science, and representatives from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. More information is available about all of these reviewers on the Evidence for Action website. The information provided in the project summary within the application and review system will be used for screening purposes to determine whether your proposal warrants further consideration by the review committee. I want to stress again to pay close attention to the, uh, to the project summary section of your application when completing your submission. If your full, full proposal meets our eligibility criteria and is responsive to the call for proposals, a larger group of reviewers will be assigned to review your proposal. Reviewers will score and make recommendations for funding to the foundation staff based on our selection criteria and appropriateness of the dissemination strategy and budget. All funding decisions for grants to U.S. organizations are made by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and grants to organizations outside of the United States will be recommended for an award through the RWJF Global Ideas Fund, which is a donor-advised fund of Charities Aid Foundation of America. Full proposals are due on Wednesday, August 26th at 12 p.m. Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time in the United States. It's recommended that you plan to submit your proposal in advance and, uh, to avoid any technical difficulties. And applicants will be notified of their funding status in November, and grants are expected to start in early 2021. We're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about what we expect from our grantees. Our program requirements have excuse me, implications for the activities we expect grantees to engage in. And we want to be transparent about these requirements early on so applicants know what to expect when they apply. 
One of our goals is to foster a grantee network in which participants can learn from one another, build on or add to existing skill sets, and possibly collaborate on current and future projects. These opportunities will happen hopefully at an in-person meeting, in addition to various times throughout the year via virtual meetings. At the program office, we also want to work closely with our grantees and have regular check-ins to understand how the projects are going, help celebrate your successes, as well as see if there's anything we can do to help you if you run into unexpected challenges. We expect grantees to register their studies in advance with the Open Science Framework. This is for transparency and accountability, both for the grantees and the program office, as well as the broader scientific community. An important component of our mission is to turn the research into action, hence our name, Evidence for Action. In order to do this, we ask our grantees to work with us to get their findings into the hands of decision makers. This is part of why we ask you to budget for open access fees. If we want people to use the research, we have to make sure it's not hidden behind a paywall. We also ask our grantees to go beyond publishing in academic journals and make their findings accessible to decision makers. This means thinking about the language, media, and other channels we use with various audiences. And so we ask applicants to develop a dissemination strategy as part of their proposal, and we keep working with our grantees to bolster their efforts and identify any additional activities to consider throughout the grant period. So I know this is a lot of information to digest, and I'm, I've already seen a number of questions come through the chat feature, and in fact, Many people submitted questions in advance. So I'll be moderating this Q&A session. I'll pull from the questions that you've been asking, those that were submitted in advance as well. So please keep in mind, we won't be able to answer all of the questions likely, and we also won't be able to answer questions about very specific applications at this time. If you do have questions about your proposal, you can contact us through other mechanisms after the webinar. I see that we have already received numerous questions through the chat here, so let's just jump into those questions. So the first one, uh, Naylin, I want to bring you into the conversation with us. So the first question we have, I'll turn to you, um, and it's what types of evidence will you consider sufficient in determining whether an intervention outside the U.S. is effective? Hi, everybody. Thanks, Erin. That's a great question. So for us to consider an intervention or an approach to be effective, there should be previous research showing that there were health or gender equity outcomes that could be attributed to the intervention. So for example, this could be through previous pilot research or an outcome or impact study from places where the intervention has been implemented. And the studies could be qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods, and they should have used valid, valid and reliable measures, high quality data, and appropriate analyses. We also value findings from natural experiments. Natural experiments are where there have been changes in large-scale programs, policies, and practices, and where researchers have been able to take advantage of those changes to establish causal evidence or effects. If there is an existing impact study currently underway, the funding from the CFP could be used to conduct a separate adaptation study as long as there's some pre-existing evidence already that supports the intervention's effectiveness. Great, thank you so much. Hirobi, I'm gonna to turn to you for the next question. Someone has asked if projects are eligible if they involve a problem that is not widespread in the United States. And as an example, they asked about the distribution of mosquito nets to control malaria. And in fact, I know this is something we talked about before, so if you could share your thoughts with the participants. Sure, happy to. You know, I think that, you know, that, that's sort of an interesting one because um, obviously, you know, the, the incidence of, of malaria in the U.S. is, is pretty close to zero, if, if, if not zero. Um, but you know, there may be aspects of a mosquito net uh, distribution program um, which might be relevant to other problems that we face in the U.S. So, you know, there, it, while the mosquito net um, 
uh, a malaria issue per se may not be relevant, there may be something about the community engagement process or the distribution model or other elements of how a mosquito net program is implemented that might, in fact, be relevant to a problem in the United States. So I wouldn't um, throw that out at face value, so to speak, um, but rather, you know, think about, you know, what aspects might be relevant to a U.S. context. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and Nancy, let me turn now to you about a question that came up relative to your, uh, when you were talking about the education system and healthcare system in the United States. So would you consider an intervention or approach that relies on a healthcare model that's different from what we have in the U.S., for example, some sort of universal healthcare delivery system? Sure. So we'll only consider interventions that could plausibly be adapted to the U.S. You know, as everyone knows, we're one of the few developed countries without a universal healthcare system. And so in, interventions that would rely on such a platform in order to work wouldn't be suitable for this particular CFP. Uh, interventions that rely on infrastructure or other conditions that just don't exist here won't be as appealing unless it can be demonstrated that those conditions could somehow be met. So it, it really does need to be applicable to the U.S. context. Great. Thank you so much. Um, there also is a question about whether the CFP is open to LGBTQ-focused projects and research. And so, Maylin, would you mind speaking a little bit more about how we've thought about the um, sort of the mix of projects that would be eligible? Absolutely. LGBTQ populations are definitely impacted by gender equity. Um, and harmful social norms around gender. And so those types of projects absolutely would be eligible. Um, and ultimately, we are looking for a mix of um, funding opportunities, um, or we're looking to for a mix of grants that represent different populations that have been marginalized based on gender. So while eligible, um, we are also you know, open to proposals about women, girls, and other populations as well. Great, thank you. So the next question is, can a collaborative partnership examine the issue in three different cultures and perhaps in different continents even, and then develop an intervention model that might not already be in place in any one of the three partnerships organizations? Uh, so I might start by saying, and then Kurobi, I'll probably turn to you to uh, add if you would like, but certainly uh, cross cultural and cross-continental interventions are appropriate. Um, I will say to reiterate that we're looking for uh, assessments of existing interventions that have some sort of evidence base to support them. Uh, so, so it may not be that the intervention is in place in all three of the places or that the lead organization is currently managing that intervention, but I think we do need there to be some evidence that that intervention already is effective versus the development of the intervention stage. Uh, Kurobi, would you like to add to that at all? Yeah, I, I think the only thing I would add is that um, sometimes if there's an intervention that is working and there's evidence that it's working in multiple places, that can speak to sort of if you like the resilience or ability of that of a particular intervention to be adapted to different contexts, and so that that can actually be helpful in thinking about how such an intervention might be adapted to a U.S. context. So in those situations, I, I you know it, it, it's it's a very good thing if there's sort of evidence that a similar intervention works in multiple contexts. Perfect. Thank you. So we did get a number of questions um, about the budget, and I'm going to sort of, I know that I did sort of skip over some detail about the budget, so I'm going to group those together right now, let you all know the questions, and then answer them 
So uh, there's a question about how much of the budget could be allocated for programmatic efforts versus for research efforts. There was also a question about whether the grant could cover salaries. Um, and then a separate question about if a multi-country application or multi-organization application were submitted, how should funding be allocated? So first of all, in terms of programmatic versus research efforts, generally uh, evidence for action requires that the majority of funding go towards research efforts. So again, these are research grants. We don't have a, an explicit breakdown either of percentage or of dollar amount that could support programmatic activities. We certainly represent, uh, understand that in terms of adaptation, there may be some, um, some programmatic support, but we would certainly expect that to be a very small proportion of the grant. Uh, it does depend a bit on the size of the budget overall, but as we mentioned, these awards are between 100,000 US dollars and 250,000 US dollars, so we would not expect very much of the grant to be supporting programmatic implementation. Uh, I, the most straightforward answer to the question about covering salaries is yes. Um, most of the time, the grants are predominantly supporting people's time and effort, which is usually in the form of salaries, so that is an appropriate use of grant funds. And in terms of how funding should be allocated, we really feel like it should be commensurate with the effort and contributions of each organization that is uh, participating in the project. And, and there is a whole section um, in the application where you'll describe what, how your budget is being allocated and why. And there's a section in the full proposal where you'll need to justify who the lead organization is. Um, and provide information about how the team will collaborate. So we really think it's important to ensure equitable representation and distribution of resources among programs, uh, among applicants, participants, and partners. Um, those are relatively logistical, straightforward questions, so that's probably sufficient for now. Um, there is another question about um, can, also sort of related to the budget about can we speak to our priorities, the, the foundation's priorities regarding the prime institution, U.S. or non-U.S., and opportunities for the co-PI structure. So we do believe um, that it is best if the intervention is or, and, the, and the project is led by the people who are most familiar with and already engaged in leading these interventions in the home country. Um, and so that means we are certainly hoping to make awards outside of the United States to non-U.S. based organizations. But we also recognize that there could be any variety of constraints to that uh, structure. And so we have not made it a requirement, um, although again, we're encouraging lead applicants from outside of the U.S. In terms of the co-PI structure, we don't at Evidence for Action have any requirements around uh, the, the PI. So it need not be the researcher necessarily, although it certainly could be. And while in the application itself, you can only denote, I think, up to three, two or three uh, PIs or co-PIs. Um, if we award the grant, we're certainly happy to accommodate as many PIs as you would like to specify. Um, let me just pause for a second and see if Maylin, you want to add anything about the lead organizations or sort of our values around um, prioritizing in in country applicants? No, I agree with you, Erin. Um, as you said, we really believe that people who are have firsthand experience with the intervention in the original setting are in a great position to. Um, really dive deep and understand and help us understand that intervention best. So we want to make sure that that side um, of the partnership is well represented. Excellent. We have another question about do projects need to be completed by the time we apply? So this is a little bit nuanced, I think. Certainly the research pro project obviously does not need to be completed. And in fact, you could be adding on uh, this research component to another research project that you may have underway. Intervention, of course, could be ongoing, and we expect that that 
likely will be the case if it's a, if it's a successful intervention. Um, Nancy, anything you'd like to add about um, the stage of the project or sort of the evidence base we're looking for? Yeah, what we're looking for is evidence that at whatever stage the project is at, number one, why the information that will be gathered will be useful in moving it forward and that that, level, and that, that can be done with sufficient rigor to know that it's attributable to the intervention. So if, it, if it's in the middle and you're collecting, still collecting data, but could give preliminary data suggesting that it's working and how the grant will help make that firmer evidence uh, that would be appropriate. So it really depends on what the research question is. And there are different research questions that, different, that may occur at different points in the cycle that Aaron presented earlier about the stages of implementation. So it would really be important to describe what, where you are in the project and what this information that could be gathered by this particular grant will inform about the applicability to the U.S. context. Excellent. Thank you for that additional detail. Carly, I'm going to turn to you again. We have a question about what do we hope to gain by applying international learning to the U.S. context? Well, that, yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think what we hope to learn is, um, I, I guess, on, on a couple of levels. One is that, you know, many places have made progress on gender equity, um, and, we could, and we can learn from those, right? Um, we, we are a, a nation that has incorporated ideas from around the world since our, our inception, and why should that stop? Um, on issues with with health or um, or gender equity, so so there are many many things that we can learn that that we hope we can um, bring here to improve um, improve gender equity. The, the other thing I would just say is that what what we're finding with our global learning more broadly is that sometimes. Um, Sometimes there isn't um, uh, some of the learning is not around a particular intervention, but it's more at the level of inspiration or opening up our imaginations and sort of recognizing that the way that we do things here is not the way that we have to do them here. That other other societies, other countries have come up with different ways of thinking about issues, different ways of constructing their societies. Um, and that, as well, is sort of, the, in a way, a, a, a meta hope of, of the learning that we're, that we're aiming to do with the CSP is just sort of opening up our imaginations to how to think about and make progress on gender equity. Excellent. Thank you. So we have a couple of questions about the partnerships about pre-existing relationships, um, what is our motivation for wanting partnerships? Maylin, would you mind speaking a little bit about our motivation behind requiring partnerships um, and, and what, might, uh, what we're looking for in terms of demonstrating that applicants have a, 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 an existing partnership? Of course. So again, um, as I said earlier, we do believe that organizations that are based in the country where an intervention might have originated from or who are very familiar with the intervention in that setting are in a great position to help us understand it. At the same time, since we're talking about adaptation, we do want an authentic and meaningful contribution from a U.S.-based partner because they're going to be able to contribute the knowledge about what it takes to adapt an intervention to a particular U.S. setting. So we're hoping for um, just a well-rounded team that represents both sides of that equation. And um, I guess the other thing I would say is the, the motivation for asking for uh, pre-existing relationships is that we know, I mean, any 
um, research project is complicated and any partnerships um, tend to be, um, you know, there, there's um, a, a lot of, there's an art to managing the workflow. And um, especially across borders and whether there could be time differences and language barriers, et cetera, um, we really wanted a demonstration that these groups had worked together before, they, that they have a good working relationship um, in order to ensure the success of the project. Great. Thank you so much. Um, there also is just a basic logistical question about which, what sort of organizations are eligible. Um, so I, I do want to clarify for people that both for-profit and non-profit organizations are eligible for funding. We still have a preference for non-profit organizations, but uh, we do recognize there are any variety of ways people may choose to set up their business operations and we don't want to, um, or we want, we want to be able to learn from all types of different organizations. Um, and, and certainly also institutions of higher education, both within and outside the United States, although again, the application eligibility is not limited to um, institutes of higher education. Um, so uh, there is another question, and Karabi, this is relatively, I think, similar to your earlier response about, um, about mosquito nets, in fact, but I'll see if you have anything to add. So it's asking if the CFP is open to research focusing on environmental interventions. Um, I think if we stopped there, there, there probably would be more to say. There's a little bit more specificity about diminishing infectious diseases that disproportionately affect women. So if you could share with us any of your thinking with the global team about um, and maybe environmental interventions more broadly and sort of infectious disease interventions, which I think is a good distinction because uh, at least domestically, RWJF focuses a little less on infectious disease, but perhaps you think about it differently from an international perspective. Yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of mulling that question. I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the focus of this CFP is gender equity. And um, so to the extent that you think about environmental health issues or infectious diseases, as um, if there's a program and intervention that is addressing those issues by, you know, increasing gender equity, then, then I think, you know, then it's probably in line. I, I think some of that might come down to seeing more of the details of, of what is being proposed. But, um, you know, you know I, I guess I want to emphasize the focus here is on gender equity. Um, those are the kinds of outcomes that, that we're looking at um, and gender equity as it connects to health equity. So um, it's a little hard to say without knowing more detail. Sure, absolutely. And I don't know, Nancy, um, if you want to say any more about sort of the general types of uh, interventions that might be of interest or um, or uh, competitive for the call. Well, I think it, it actually relates to what you just said about whether it relates to gender equity. So the the, the types of interventions are really quite open to what they might be. They're most likely to be in the social determinants is that gender operates largely through social factors. Uh, but we're quite open to different kinds of interventions. They, they may be uh, policy-based, they may be direct influence. We're, we're interested, though, in interventions that aren't a person at a time, because those are less likely to be scalable. Um, we would be open to it if there's a good rationale for how it could be scalable to large populations and could be widespread enough that it would really affect gender equity. Karen, I'm not sure if you had some other thoughts on what kinds of interventions would be appropriate. No, I, I totally agree with everything that's been said so far. I um, and I am also noticing that we already have, I guess, time flies when you're having 
interesting conversations because we're already almost out of time, and I do want to make sure to share some additional resources with folks. Um, so so I, I really appreciate all your thoughts, Nancy and Kroby and Malin. Thank you for joining us for the Q&A. Um, I know we did not get to everyone's questions. Uh, I thank you for participating and joining and, and um, being engaged. I do want to let you know that um, there are frequently asked questions available on our website. We'll have an archived version of this application of this webinar there, um, and and in fact we have uh, overviews of the call for proposals in multiple languages on the website as well. The the call itself in its entirety is in English, but there are some overviews and. Um, in, in multiple other languages and other resources. And the questions that we didn't get to, we will in fact update our frequently asked questions to respond. And you can contact us directly as well. We also have a couple of other opportunities for you to engage with us directly. We'll be hosting virtual office hours during which time applicants are invited to join us on Zoom or via phone to get their questions answered if you were not able to get them answered today. And we also just this morning posted a new blog that goes into further detail about adaptation science generally. So I encourage you to check that out as well. Again, everything is available on the Evidence for Action website. And here are all the sort of myriad of ways that you can get in touch with us. If you do have additional questions that we weren't able to sufficiently address today, please do submit them to Evidence for Action at ucsf.edu with the subject line Global CFP. We will respond directly via email, and then again, we'll make answers publicly available on our website for those questions that may be of general interest to other applicants. You can also follow us on Twitter or our other social media channels like Facebook, connect with us on LinkedIn, or sign up for our e-newsletter. And I just want to end by thanking you so much for joining us, participants, thanking Kurobi and Nancy and Mei Lin for your time today. You will receive a post-webinar survey, and we encourage your feedback to us and additional questions. And we look forward to your submissions, reviewing your proposals, and learning from you around the world. Thank you so much. Have a good day.